we'll, uh, we'll start the, um, the webinar. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar on behalf of everyone at eBury. My name is Boris, and I'm the country manager for eBury Canada. Um, many of our clients actually are facing inefficiencies when doing cross-border trade with emerging markets, and we get a lot of questions on how to optimize this and how to mitigate the risks involved. Um, so today's webinar is about how to navigate uncertainty in emerging markets with a special focus on the Indian rupee. Um, so our head of FX dealing, Anand, will update us on the markets, talking about both dollar Canada, um, dollar CNY, as well as dollar INR. And uh, he will be followed by our senior FX dealer, uh, Pedro, who is walking us through the benefits of hedging INR. And he will also be discussing a case study um, on how window forwards in Indian rupee can help you mitigate that risk. If there are any questions, please drop them in the Q&A section below of your, in, the, in the lower end of your screen. And we will answer all the questions at the end of this presentation. Um, so thanks again to all of our clients and prospects for the continuous trust and support. Um, we hope this will be a valuable and insightful session for all of you. And I will now pass it on to Anand. Thanks. Thank you, Boris. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's start off with our favorite currency pair, Dollar Canada. Uh, could you switch, switch to the next slide, please? Yeah. Uh, so here we have certain factors that are affecting the Canadian dollar, both to weaken the Canadian and to strengthen the Canadian dollar. Uh, on the weakening side, side, if we were to begin, uh, US inflation continues to rise and pent up inflationary pressure, uh, pressures are currently present in the economy. We believe that the US economy is going to open up faster than expected. And we think that uh, sectors such as airlines that have been affected in the past uh, will start opening up. This will build up inflationary pressures. Uh, the, both the CPI as well as the core PC inflation numbers have been rising consistently. We think that the 10 year bond yields will rise to 2%. They're currently trading at 1.6%. And if that happens, we'll see an upside move in Dollar Canada. There's also a technical support in the region around 120.30 to 120.50. We noticed in the last three weeks that the market has held around these levels. So it has caused uh, sufficient impetus for Dollar Canada to start moving higher from these levels. We do believe that this is a medium term bottom for the next two months or three months. While we might have sporadic moves to the downside, generally speaking, there might be some support around these levels. Also, um, Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen of the US and Feds Powell uh, mentioned hawkish comments in the past, uh, past week or so. So the, their expectation was that the market could benefit from an interest rate hike in the US. And uh, if that comes out to play, I think uh, somewhere around October or so this year, we might be looking at a change in the policy stance for the US and a rate hike in earlier than expected in the United States. So if that happens, we'll see more weakness in the Canadian dollar. So now moving on to str uh, strength for the Canadian dollar, uh, there are three main aspects to look at. One is oil. We've been seeing that oil prices have been going up consistently. Uh, currently the front month futures is trading at $71 a barrel. We think that it will head higher towards $75 a barrel. OPEC plus continues to remain positive. Uh, of a global surge in oil demand. That's because economies in the US, Europe, and China have been recovering at a much faster pace. So if that happens, the demand for oil continues to grow. At present, we also have a policy divergence between the US Fed and Bank of Canada. While the US continues to remain accommodative on the bond buying program and continues to maintain rates at near, near zero levels, Bank of Canada is expected to hike rates mid next year. So this divergence in policy is causing further flows into the Canadian dollar from the US dollar. Uh, the third aspect is the vaccine rollout. As you all have seen and witnessed, uh, the pace of rollouts in Canada has increased quite significantly. And this has led to uh, a quicker recovery in the economy than expected, as we'll see in the next slide. Next slide, please. So here's a chart of the Canadian GDP total versus the unemployment rates. So as we see uh, on a year on year basis, uh, the GDP for Canada has increased by 5.67%. And uh, in terms of the total number, the, we are now at a level that's better than the pre-pandemic levels. This is in spite of the fact 
that unemployment rates are at 8.2 percent, well above the pre-pandemic levels closer to 5.4 percent. This means we now have uh, sorry. This means that we now have uh, an efficiency in the market, and uh, this is basically a good thing for Canada, which could lead to further uh, improvement in uh, the Canadian dollar or strengthening in the Canadian dollar. Next slide, please. So here's a five-year chart of US inflation data, CPI and core PCE data. As we see, the numbers have been climbing pretty significantly. There are still more and more inflationary pressures uh, underlying the US economy. We believe that these numbers will continue to rise. And when they do, they'll provide support for the US dollar. Next slide, please. Here's a chart of US non-farm payroll and unemployment rates. So as we see, uh, markets have dropped. The unemployment rate has dropped down to around 5.8% in the US. It's still above pre-pandemic levels, but uh, we believe that the move in the last few months has been fairly strong for the US uh, and is positive for the US dollar. The non-farm payroll numbers have also normalized closer to pre-pandemic levels. And we believe that this is once again positive for the US dollar. Next slide, please. Moving on to the Chinese Yuan, uh, which is the talk of the town, um, essentially because the Yuan has appreciated about 12% against the US dollar in the last eight months. Uh, why has this been happening? Do we expect this to continue? What's our forecast going forward? We do believe that the Yuan has more appreciation to come. And uh, looking at certain other um, criteria, so let's look at what's causing a weaker Chinese Yuan at the moment. So US economic data recovery provides support uh, to the US dollar against most emerging market currencies. As you notice, inflation has been going up in the US uh, on a year on year basis. GDP has improved in the US uh, by 0.4%. And we think that this recovery is gonna continue. And if that happens, we'll see more buying in USD against Chinese Yuan and other emerging market currencies. Also, we're currently at a three-year high uh, in terms of uh, the Chinese yuan. So at this particular level, uh, it's starting to hurt Chinese exports. Uh, so we believe that the PBOC will continue to intervene uh, in more indirect means uh, in order to support this, uh, in order to prevent this move from continuing to happen in a very quick pace. So more recently, the PBOC directed banks to hold 2% more foreign currency reserves raise the limit from 5% to 7% uh, starting from June 15th. And this is in order to reduce the US dollar liquidity that's available in the market. We believe this will curb uh, Yuan's appreciation momentarily. Moving on to the stronger RMB side, uh, I do believe that we have a lot more uh, weighing in on this side. So if you look at foreign currency deposits in Chinese banks, they grew to over a trillion dollars. This is the highest that it has ever been. And foreign currency loans on the other side have decreased. So uh, on a net basis, banks are holding more surplus dollars than before, which they want to offload into the market, which is what is causing all of the selling of US dollar against the Chinese yuan. Also, yield differentials uh, between China and US continue to remain high. So it's 3.1% for a 10-year yield bond in China and 1.6% currently for a US 10-year note which is causing the outflow from US from the bond market and an inflow into the Chinese bond market. Uh, also, if you're looking at economic recovery, year on year, the GDP growth has been at 18.3% for China. So they clearly lead the way in terms of economic recovery. We believe that there is a lot more room for strengthening of the Chinese yuan. On to the next slide, please. So to Indian rupee, uh, the main currency that this webinar has been based on. Uh, we believe that it was important to bring this up because uh, the moves that we've seen in CNY, we expect similar moves to happen in the Indian rupee as well going forward. Uh, the reason being, so let's look at what's going to cause strength in the INR. Uh, in the last fiscal year, uh, 2020 to 21 in India, we saw foreign direct investment increase and grow to a level of 81.67 billion US dollars. This is a 10% increase on a year on year basis. And it's the highest level of FDI investment that we've seen in a fiscal year in India. We expect this trend to continue. And uh, also on the other hand, Indian imports have been lower. India's import is generally focused around oil. 
And uh, in spite of oil prices continuing to move to the upside, uh, we haven't really um, seen a massive hit on Indian imports. That's because imports in general, because of the COVID crisis, have reduced in India. This can further cause strengthening of the INR. Also, the central bank in India, the Reserve Bank of India, uh, continued to buy US dollars uh, by about $200 billion between 2019 and uh, 2021. So um, in spite of everything that was happening globally, in spite of the fact that emerging markets were strengthening, the INR could not strengthen as much because the Reserve Bank continued to buy US dollars. We believe that they've already bought sufficient uh, quantities of US dollars. The current uh, reserve stands at 600 billion. And we believe the central bank will step aside. And uh, if there is more appreciation to come in the INR, it will happen quickly. India's inclusion into the global bond index is another important parameter. So we expect this to happen in October uh, of this year. It will still take a 12 month time frame in order for funds to actually start coming into the Indian market. But it provides or opens a gateway for asset management firms that have uh, a mandate to invest in the global bond index to start sending funds into Indian bonds. And as that happens, uh, cumulatively speaking, we are looking at a stronger rupee uh, going forward. Cases for a weaker INR, essentially if the US Fed starts moving toward a hawkish stance and plan to increase interest rates, we believe that there'll be some strengthening in the US dollar. Also, if there's a risk off scenario leading to Chinese Yuan weakness in the market, I think that will spill over as an effect uh, into other emerging markets like the Indian rupee. Post lockdown, we expect imports to surge in India. Uh, this is uh, essentially going to cause more purchases of oil. Uh, and with oil at current levels, we believe that it'll hit India's imports. So on one hand, I'd say there is still some room for weakness in INR, but overall, the picture still looks like a stronger rupee. Next slide, please. So here's uh, an outlook in terms of a timeline, uh, in terms of what's happening in the market, what risks exist in the market. Primarily, we've tried to uh, list main central bank meetings that are coming out, Bank of Canada, US, uh, the PBOC, uh, the ECB, and the BOE. And we're also looking at certain leading indicators of the market, such as retail sales and other aspects related to monetary policy, like the CPI and the unemployment data. We will be sharing this slide with you after the webinar, but this is something to just maybe take a second look at. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll pass it on to Pedro, who will speak to us about the benefits of paying in local currencies now. Thank you very much, Anand. Um, yeah, so I'll be going into, into the more practical side, focused on, on, on the commercial benefits of, of working in local currency. As Boris rightly said at the beginning of the, during the introduction, um, the, the topic of, of, of local currencies and local currency payments has been extremely relevant to, to something that we've been um, discussing with our clients for the past uh, three years. Um, very proactively, especially after we saw at the end of 2017, 2018, the, the case of the, of the US dollar uh, renminbi, when, when the renminbi started appreciating um, considerably against the USD. And therefore, as a result of it, there was a generalized uh, price hike in, in US dollar prices from, from China, Chinese imports. So uh, that's when we really saw the, the commercial benefits uh, to, to, to Western importers uh, in terms of their, of their bottom line of negotiating prices in, in local currency. So the benefits uh, range uh, and, and uh, are, are quite diverse depending on, on the currency pair and the, depending on, the, on certain specific factors to, to that, to that uh, exporting nation. But um, so generally, we, we consider the, the, the main benefits of paying local currency, the ones that we're going to discuss here. But again, the importance or the relevance of each benefit um, differs from, from country to country and, and uh, um, in ex ex exporting nation uh, per se. So um, the, the main and, and most obvious and, 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 in my opinion, relevant uh, benefit of, of local currency payments and pricing is uh, to eliminate indirect unidirectional FX risk uh, of paying in, in USD. So um, 
this is something that we really uh, insist on the, the, the categorizing this type of risk as indirect and unidirectional, especially because it, it tends to be one, a one-sided risk, which ends up affecting generally the, the Western imports when, whenever there's, uh, there's a negative move in, in the USD local currency um, pair against the Chinese, in this case, uh, exporter or Indian exporter. So it means that whenever, whenever rates, as what we see on, on, the, on the coming slide, whenever rates are favorable to the, to the exporter, prices remain constant. Whenever rates of, of local currency conversion, uh, conversion uh, go against them, the general rule is that USD prices increase. So um, another benefit is the higher visibility against price increases, of course. So eliminating the currency risk allows you to really notice when price is being increased um, to, to notice what the main reason is, whether it's um, commodity prices, materials, et cetera, et cetera. Another, another benefit is to improve longer term relationship with suppliers, as obviously it eliminates the, the, the risk of, of price hikes and, and those uncomfortable sit, uh, situations when prices have to be renegotiated with the suppliers. And then it can also be used as a negotiating tool. So it can also be used proactively from, from the Western importer as a way of eliminating that, that uh, FX risk um, faced by the, by, the, by the exporter uh, and a way to achieve more competitive pricing as a result of it. Then also, the, the terms, this is a bit linked to, to that final, uh, to that previous point, there tends to be a frequent, frequent improvement in the, in the final uh, Canadian dollar, in this case, cost for the, for the importer. And then also it allows us and, and our clients to achieve more efficient and, and sustainable FX hedging strategies. This is mainly because, again, we're reducing that indirect unidirectional FX risk. So we are able to focus on the whole uh, or the entirety of the FX risk posed by, by, by that trade flow. Um, if we go to the next slides, please. So this um, is a very practical example of, of that price increase uh, risk. So that um, indirect unidirectional FX risk. So here in this graph, we've got a case of, a, of an importing company, a uh, Western importing company that sets their pricing at the beginning of the year with Chinese importers, as, as is usually the case. Um, and where you can see on the first time beginning of the year, so that's the budget rate that the Chinese exporters set for, for those, in this case, we're talking about China, so for those exports. So as long as the, we can see as, as the months go by, going towards the right-hand side of the graph, as the, as, as the market rates for, in this case, USD, renminbi, go above that budget rate, the, the, the profit margin of the, of the exporter increases. So you can see underneath, month to month that it increases 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 1.5%. So during this whole period, the prices in USD stay constant, right? But as soon as they start going in the opposite direction, so the risk starts affecting them, the, the budget, the, the, the pricing that they, that they marked at the beginning of the year and the budget rate that they set for USD RMB in this case, starts to, starts to eat on the margin. So their margins start seeing a reduction so it's in, in this case, when it gets to the, ultimate, to, to, to the ultimate budget level that they set initially at the beginning of the year, when they have to uh, hike uh, prices again. So when they do hike prices, obviously they, again, look for another buffer, which tends to be between three and 10%, increasing their USD prices and covering any potential risk for the coming, for the coming months. So this is the real, the real risk that, we, that we're running here and the risk that we've seen with, for example, the Chinese Yuan uh, so far this year. Next slide, please. So yeah, I mean, um, suppliers, when, when we do see, and from, from our experience back in 2018 with, with China and our experience so far this year as well, when, when, we, when we notice these price increases in USD from, from suppliers, uh, which are mainly a cause of, of FX volatility on their end, um, very rarely they, they tend to attribute this to, to FX. So the, the, most, the most common reasons for, for uh, pricing hikes that we notice are either rising materials and labor costs, which uh, to be fair, this, this last year, especially the last four to six months, has been one of the, one of the reasons for, for those uh, price hikes. Commodity prices, again, very similar. 
They also tend to blame new legislation in the local um, in, the, uh, in, in the local legislation. So perhaps a sustainability or environmental taxation, labor taxation, etc. Um, so, so these are the main excuses that normally tend to be used by, by, by exporters instead of the FX. But in, in our experience, uh, the, the, the larger and most volatile price increases that we, that we experience as, are normally directly correlated with, with the USD local currency pair. So by, by setting, like I said before, by setting a base pricing local currency, the importer, the Western importer can take full control of the, of the FX risk. Uh, derived from from imports and and avoids that additional indirect usd local currency risk this ensures in turn more transparency and uh, longer term price stability uh, for for the western importer if we can go over to the next slides yeah so so in this case me and anad uh, will be shifting this a bit more specifically to india and and negotiating prices in in inr so um, if we could skip to the next slide. So yeah, I mean, um, in the case of India, traditionally exporters have been, has, have been generally used to, to setting prices and invoices in, in USD. This um, has been a, a, a longstanding trend. And uh, however, in, in contrast with, with other countries where, where base costs might, might be larger in USD because of, of uh, commodity, imports and materials being priced also in USD. In the case of India, both for products and, and services, uh, they rely heavily on, on local labor and, and also materials. So it's obviously, it's a very rich country in terms of, of commodities and materials. So a huge part of the, of the base cost of any, of any Indian company is always gonna be denominated in INR. Um, most, most of the, these Indian companies uh, are, used to uh, setting prices in, in USD and Euro, as, as we were mentioning, but by doing so, they, they bear a huge FX risk posed by, by both currencies when converted back to, to INR. So as a result of this, as we were, we were mentioning before with, with the case of China, they tend to add buffer margins when, when they do price in USD. So uh, just to protect them against any specific currency fluctuations, which uh, as I'm sure Anand will also mention in, in a minute, uh, are in the case of India, quite, quite, uh, quite large and, and important when, when they do happen. And then um, even though, even though the, the, the Indian company in this case is the one bearing the, the or facing the, the ethics risk, as we said before, this risk is ultimately transferred to the, to the Western clients. Uh, and whenever this buffer, which they said initially, uh, is, is surpassed, so directly affecting the, the, the operational margins of the, of the Indian exporter, that risk and that negative impact is transferred uh, directly to, to, the, to the Western client. If we skip to the next slide, I think this is where Anand is going to jump in. Thanks, Pedro. Um, I think we have two aspects to look at. One is, does this benefit you as a client and does it benefit your supplier to convert into INR as a receiver and what barriers to entry do we generally face when we're speaking or negotiating with suppliers and on the other hand how is the supplier looking at market movements in INR and what risk do they think they implicitly have while they're pricing in either US dollar or in INR so to start with the first part barriers to negotiating with suppliers some of the things that we've come across with some clients is essentially suppliers believe that they will take a tax loss, essentially not receive a tax rebate. If they receive payments in INR for exports, uh, they also believe that settlement of exports must be realized in freely convertible currency, which excludes INR in this case, and that their bank account can't receive INR from abroad for exports. These are in some cases, and if that's the case, uh, Generally speaking, we can handle these misconceptions very easily. Um, the Reserve Bank of India does allow uh, receiving INR and they do get a tax rebate for exports even if they receive funds in INR. The only caveat is that they would have to receive funds in INR through a freely convertible Vastra account that they'll have to set up with a bank in India. So um, moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, once we get through these hurdles, and once the supplier agrees to receive INR payments for their exports to you, 
how would you then plan your budgeting? How would you then protect your profit margins, right? So initially you are paying the supplier in US dollars or in Canadian dollars, and you were hedging that risk by creating a budget rate against dollar Canada. So if the market moves lower, you buy better than budget rate in dollar Canada and essentially protect your margins. Now, once the invoicing begins in INR and the supplier starts receiving Indian rupees, essentially your budget rate would be in Canadian dollars against Indian rupees. So there are multiple ways in which you can hedge your currency risk to ensure that you can be better than your budgeted rates. And we have several products uh, that can help enable you to do so with different and varying levels of flexibility. Some Indian exporters have a good understanding of the benefits of INR pricing and risk. However, even those that do know have been looking at a traditionally weaker INR over the years. And this is essentially a barrier to entry because suppliers believe that if INR is generally depreciating or has been doing so traditionally, on an average basis, they would be able to convert the US dollars that you send to them into INR at better FX rates, which is why there has been a pushback from a market view perspective for suppliers to convert into INR. Let's look at what's changed today compared to what's been happening over the last five or 10 years and why we think this is a time when emerging market currencies like the INR, CNY, and very specifically for domestic reasons in INR, uh, the currency is going to appreciate. To the next slide, please. Uh, or to the next one, please. So here's a five-year chart of dollar rupee. And we noticed that between mid-2017 and mid-2018, we had a, about a 10% weakening of the INR. And the same thing happened again between mid-2019 and 2020. So about 10% depreciation, give or take, uh, has been the norm in the last five years sporadically. So markets move up in dollar rupee and they come back down. They normalize and they move back up and back down again. As you see, technically, we are currently trading under the below the five-year trend line that's in place. And we do have a resistance in place. I'd also like to look at how the foreign currency reserves for the Reserve Bank of India has changed over this period and how this has affected the market. Could we move to the next slide, please? So here's a look at uh, the Reserve Bank of India's FX reserves. Currently we stand at $600 billion. In 2014, we were closer to 300. So if we looked at those periods that we were talking about earlier, mid 2017 to mid 2018, we saw a small move up in reserves, but still a significant uh, weakening of the Indian rupee. And again, we saw that move, uh, a small move up from 350 to about 420 billion in FX reserve increase. And at the same time, we saw about a 10% depreciation. If you look at what's happened more recently, 2019 to now, we've gone from 400 billion in reserves to 600 billion in US dollar reserves for the Reserve Bank of India. And during that same period, the currency has failed to depreciate significantly, in spite of the fact that this increase is almost a 40% increase in reserves. But the currency, on the other hand, has not weakened as much. It should have weakened by at least 15%, given this current uh, change in the reserves. This is happening because of multiple factors that we discussed earlier, where India is likely to be uh, a part of the global bond index. There's a lot of expectation of funds to be moving into India. And on the flip side, uh, given that the central bank currently has 600 billion in reserves, foreign in investors are, more, are feeling more and more secure to invest in India because they don't believe there's gonna be a run on the currency. With that happening, and we've already seen the results over the last year, FDI, a foreign direct investment coming in at $82 billion, uh, and FI investments also increasing, we believe that this trend has now shifted and we might be closer to a region that we were back in November for the CNY. So back in November for CNY, we were trading 6.8, 6.8 for the dollar RMB. And now we're trading closer to 6.36. 6 
we believe that this is the right time to start negotiating with suppliers to start converting into INR so that your risk is in the correct currency. If the market drops to 66 on dollar rupee, there is a good chance that suppliers will start hiking prices in INR just like they did in CNY. On to the next slide, please. Yeah, so I'll hand off to Pedro, uh, who will help us understand uh, the different solutions that eBury has to help with hedging your risk in INR. Yep. So um, as many of you are most likely aware of uh, right now, uh, one of the well, one of the areas where eBury tries to add a huge value to, to its clients is through the through the protection of, of operational margins, like uh, Anand was, was mentioning just now. So we do have a few, um, a range of products that, that we can use to, to hedge that currency risk. Um, the two main ones, which I'm going to discuss here very briefly, again, because it's, it's something that's probably very present for, for everyone, uh, are fixed forwards and window forwards. So fixed forwards, which is the most traditional tool that, that we can use in, in terms of FX hedging, doesn't give us the flexibility to, to, to use um, the, the tool throughout a, a, a certain window of time. So it sets a, a date in the future by when we want, to, we want to transact, we want to deliver that currency that we're buying. And by, by when said uh, hedge, said uh, contract has to be settled. So it's a great way of uh, ensuring certain payments that, that we have when, when, for example, we've been dealing with one same supplier for a long period of time, and we have an exact date or a very approximate date of, of, of payment. That allows us to, to, to protect the, the um, FX rate for that specific rate, that specific payment. And by doing so in a more efficient or more specific manner in terms of time window, it allows us to, to be slightly more, um, achieve a slightly more beneficial uh, FX rate for, for, for the outcome. Then the other option that we have is practically the same product, but giving us the, the, the flexibility uh, of, of making use of that contract uh, within an, uh, a given period of time, so a given window. So this is the most common product that we use with, with our clients at, at eBury for two main reasons, mostly because it gives that added flexibility, but also because it allows us to look at longer term hedging strategies. So instead of just looking at a, looking at a, at a way of protecting the, the budget rate for each specific payment that we're gonna have to do, we can look at a wider period of time to cover, for example, a whole season or a, 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 a quarter of the, of the year in terms of purchases. Even, even a whole year. So, so this is the most, uh, the most common one. Uh, a, a very frequent uh, way of working with window forwards, for example, is to use different windows for different periods of time. So for example, doing a bi-yearly uh, forward. So one covering the first half of the year and another covering just the second half of the year. If we go over to, to the next slide, just to, to round up, um, we're gonna be looking at one uh, very interesting case study for, for, for INR. Uh, one of our clients who had quite a big exposure to, to India. Boris, if you could skip to the, thank you. So, so I think this, this case study really puts into perspective the benefits of both paying in local currency and the, 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 the basic uh, or, or the benefits of, of paying in INR as well. So this was a, a Canadian technology company that's been working with us for about two years uh, now. So it's, an, it's a technology company outsourcing as many similar companies do their IT support services to an Indian provider, uh, focusing on, on both IT support and, and customer service. Um, and, and in turn, this Indian provider works with companies around the globe. So as a result of this, uh, the Indian supplier bases their prices in, in USD, always has, uh, had always done with, with all clients they worked with. And uh, even though some of their equipment costs were ba based in USD as they were importing from China, uh, they, they did mention to our client that above 90% of their, of their overall costs were, were based in INR, obviously in this case, because uh, a, a majority of those costs were, were labor. Our client, um, so our client also, also imports from, from China, uh, very large volumes uh, on, on the whole technological part. So we, this, this is actually one of the clients that we started focusing on local payments back in, in 2019. And discussing with them the advantages of, of, of paying in, in, in RMB to, to China. 
uh, especially to avoid any possible price increases that could occur again as they did in, in 2017, 2018. So the, this was actually a perfect example of, of good timing because we, we started discussing this at the end of 2019. By the start of 2020, we had spoken with, so the client had spoken with the suppliers. We assisted them as well from, from our Hong Kong office in, in getting the message across to the supplier and, and really the benefits both for our client and for the supplier himself of, of invoicing in, in RMB. And as a result of this, with most suppliers that our client worked with in, in China started pricing in, in RMB prior to, to March 2020. So, so as a result of this, when, when the, the valuation of the, of the dollar against the, the, the RMB happened in, in August last year, most of, the, most of the suppliers that our client was working with didn't write, uh, um, raise prices as much as, as those suppliers invoicing in USD. So they avoided about a 7 to 10% price increase uh, by having arranged pricing in RMB prior to, prior to August 2020. Uh, in the next slide, we will see. So, um, so yeah, so by ha having seen the benefits of, of, of paying in local currency, this, this client uh, internally made the uh, internal policy of, of trying to pay, pay uh, as, as, far as, as far as is possible every single uh, international supplier in their own local currency. So after having a few discussions with them as well and, and focusing on the INR and their exposure to our INR and, and the forecasts or, or you know, medium term uh, outlook that we have for, for INR as, as Anand was, was mentioning just now, we, we, we discussed this with the client and they were extremely interested again in trying to anticipate any possible price increases uh, and, and start negotiating uh, straight away prices in, in, in INR. So traditionally, uh, the, this client always worked uh, quite conserv conservatively. They had quite a good forecast of payments that they had to do to India. So they used to always close a window forward, 12 month window forward USD CAD at the end of the year covering their, their coming year. So they always used to cover about 80% of their expected payments. And um, just as, as, as they've been doing uh, back in December, 2020, they did, they covered, uh, they, they designed their hedging strategy for 2020 uh, using window forward a USD CAD of, of 129.50 at the time. So when discussing INR, one of the key uh, issues for, for the client was what do I do with that uh, USD CAD hedge that I booked back in December and which I'm supposed to use during 2021. So uh, what we did from Ebri is uh, create a bespoke restructuring plan for the client, whereby we allowed them to transfer that USD CAD contract over to CAD INR so that they could still use it with this same supplier. And at the same time, we tried to, we tried to um, build it in a way that uh, their current USD CAD uh, hedge that they had at uh, 129.50 could be transferred further into the future. I, instead of just for 2021, transferring part of that hedge over to 2022. Then also taking advantage of, of the current uh, uh, USD INR and CAD INR rates at that time, which were very favorable for, for the clients to improve the average further for both the hedges of 2021 and 2022. So over in this last slide, I've included a, a very, well, a small visual representation of what we did from, from, from Uber's perspective. So you can see on the top in the red color, the um, USD CAD hedge that the client had. So the client agreed with their, with their Indian supplier to start paying an INR from uh, half to 2021, so from July. So what they did was they got everything that they had left over in, in that USD CAD contract. And they transferred that, as I said, uh, to the second half of 2021 and to 2022. So what we did was split that amount into three equal contracts um, and then in order to improve the, the average rates and to top up those, those window forwards, which, which the client likes, you know, as I said before, they like to hedge at least 80% of their, of their exposure. We booked um, uh, uh, the, the same amount for each of the forwards at the current market rates for CAD INR, improving the average. So as you can see, what we end up with is one forward to cover second half of 2021, another one for the first half of 2022, 
and the last one for the uh, second half of 2022. Achieving an overall average of 57.52 CAD INR for, for that client. And yeah, I think that's it for my side. All right, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, we run a bit late, but um, I do have two questions from uh, from some of the attendants. So, um, what is the cost of trading CAD INR versus G10 currencies like USD CAD, for example? Not sure if, if Anand or Pedro wants to take that one. Anand? Sure, I could take it. Could you repeat that question again, please, Boris? What is the yeah. cost of trading CAD INR versus dollar CAD? Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it depends. Um, it depends on the way the window is structured. It depends on multiple factors. Liquidity is still available for us in um, INR as much as it's available in Dollar Canada. So in terms of spreads, in terms of things of that nature, it would not make any difference to you as a client uh, to switch over from Dollar CAD to CAD INR. So, um, I would say that liquidity is fairly the same, irrespective of whether you're trading dollar cat or cat INR, and we can give you good good prices there. And the second and last question is: What are the payment times of INR payments? Do they take the same time as US dollar payments, for example? Uh, Pedro, maybe you can take this one. Yep, sure. So uh, in terms of in terms of delivery times, um, there there is a very small difference between paying in USD and um, paying in INR. So with with USD, as, as many of you know, the delivery time is is same day, uh, even within a couple of hours. The difference between uh, between USD and INR would be of just one day, um, when when you consider European time. So given that we're in 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 um, uh, well, Canadian time over here. Uh, we would be looking in most cases at D plus two, which means if we do the trade today, the INR would be delivered uh, within two within two working days, so day after tomorrow. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, that's it um, on on our side. So thanks again uh, to everyone that joined this webinar today. Um, it was a pleasure. Uh, giving you a bit more insights on, on the capabilities that we have, as well as the uh, things that uh, play an important role in these days. Um, we will be sharing this uh, recording um, later today or tomorrow. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out to your uh, relationship manager and um, have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.